My name is Joe LaHoot. I'm 93 years old. I was born in this apartment, in the other room, in 1922. Good morning, folks. Thanks for tuning in to 1063 The Notch, Anthem of the North Country. We'd like to take a quick moment and congratulate the LaHoots on the upcoming 100th anniversary of their iconic store. Joe LaHoot Sr.'s still kicking, and LaHoots is now America's oldest ski store. Stay tuned for some groovy new jams to keep your day rolling in the North Country. Time for the calisthenics. Go. I had a pretty standard relationship with, with him growing up, like until I was probably in middle school, high school, and my relationship vastly changed with him. For me, like most people, I spent the early years of my life growing up in a small town, and all I wanted to do is leave and start something new. It took leaving the North Country and moving out West for me to realize how special my grandfather is. Over time, he began to open up about his past, our family's heritage, and the history behind the store. Three generations of my family had run the store, and I realized just how ingrained they all were in our community. The North Country began to call for me, and as my grandfather got older and his health started to diminish, the decision to stay out west became even harder. When you tell somebody that I would die happy if you were here, that's heavy to drop on a 27-year-old. In the heart of the North Country lies Franconia Notch, and is home to the state of New Hampshire's iconic hero, the old man in the mountain, representing fortitude, strength, and perseverance for the community of the North Country. Franconia Notch is in northern New Hampshire, just south of the Canadian border, and about two hours north of Boston. Battling the weather in New England as a skier is unlike any place in the world. It's one of the most rugged climates in the country and is home to some of the most resilient people I've ever met. It's also home to Camden Mountain, one of the oldest ski areas in the country. This is just kind of where I'm from and being here in the notch in just this area of the country is, is where I, I feel at home. My grandfather and I continued a lot of dialogue when I got into college and into the West. It's a much different relationship with someone who, he isn't my dad's age, he isn't like 60, like he's 90. He's gonna be 94 in June. It's just a relationship, it's, it's unique. Don't bother me. You're gonna kill me. All right, get the hell out of here so I can nap. Oh, goddamn bunch. Oh, Christ almighty. The store was below the apartment when I was born, and still is today. My mother ran the store, and we worked with her. I, I didn't have a lot of friends. He was a child that grew up in the Depression, whose dad died when he was 12. His parents, neither of them could read or write. They were illiterate. His parents were immigrants and he was made fun of. There were no people of color in this area, so anybody that was slightly different looking was going to be teased about that. I think his dad was pretty emotionally abusive and uh, he didn't have the greatest childhood. 
I think in some ways he considered himself sort of an outsider, sort of a loner. They're looking at this guy and saying, what's going on here? You know, where, where did these folks come from? That might be one of the reasons too that he liked skiing so much because he was by himself and he could, he could go faster than everybody. So that was his way of showing them that he was just as good, if not better. It was an escape mechanism for him because it got him out of the house and away from a family situation which wasn't ideal. The environment is so fierce, you have to be a pretty strong person to go the route that I did. As thousands of immigrant families were arriving in America, tensions abroad were rising. And before they knew it, the Second World War was beginning. 1941, World War II started in December of that year. Now, he had a deferment. He was the only son of a widowed mother, but he went in. And so he went into the United States Army. As World War II was picking up overseas, skiing was gaining popularity back in America. At the time, there was only one famous, famous skier in the world, Austrian-born Hannes Schneider. As the Germans gained power and pushed into Austria, Hannes was imprisoned for not pledging his allegiance to the Nazi party. Back in New Hampshire, a ski mountain developer saw an opportunity. He negotiated Hannes' release from Nazi captivity so he could come to America and help promote skiing in New England. When Hannes arrived, skiing exploded. Even Babe Ruth came to visit him in the North Country. This was the catalyst for literally hundreds of new ski areas all over New Hampshire. Thousands of skiers started to flood into the North Country from New York and Boston. Encouraged by ski toes, open slopes, and transportation to the mountains, people were beginning to try skiing, and ski fever spread from coast to coast. Via special snow trains, the winter sport fans are deserting the big town by the thousands, bound for ski trails in the north. After World War II, what Harness had introduced to America changed, from a sport to a full-blown subculture. This is it. This is the ski happening. Go ahead, if you feel like yodeling, let it go. Although people were skiing nationwide at this point, New Hampshire was really paving the way. You had the first aerial tramway in the country at Cannon, the ski mobile at Cranmore, and the Nansen ski jump in Berlin. But at the time it was built, it was the biggest ski jump in the world. It happened in New Hampshire first. That includes the country's first slalom race, downhill, giant slalom, first professional ski patrol, all down the street from the shop. As skiing continued to flourish in America, World War II came to an end. My grandfather and thousands of other veterans started coming back to New Hampshire. I remember him telling me often when he um, came home from the service and how he sat in the train station, deciding should he come back home or should he go west. He felt obligated because his mom was alone running the store and he came back. He worked very hard. We were open seven days a week. We still sold beer. We still sold groceries. They opened at seven in the morning and they closed at 11 at night. And it was him, my grandmother, and my aunt Gladys. What I think many that weren't around in those days might forget is that my grandmother ran the store for 66 years. She was a second grade educated, first generation immigrant from Lebanon who was 17 when she got married and lost her husband in the early 20s with three kids. You know, it was that generation that came over here from Lebanon. They were tough people. He went back to helping my grandmother in the store and all the other guys came back as well. And they all came back and my dad said the winter of 46, 47, they all went skiing every day. And I think a lot of them went out there just to escape what had happened to them during the war. 
and it was a way of moving on. Right after the war, directly after the war, I put the goddamn skis on and got out there and did it. It was my idea to start selling skis, anything for the outdoors. One side of the store was groceries and beer, and up in the left-hand corner, I had my little shop going. If you look at the front door and the glass around the uh, front of the store is the same as it was in those days. They'd go in the back and take a hunk of cheese and take a bottle of beer. And, you know, they made a good time out of it. I think what separates La Hoots from any store that you're going in in your own town is just, it feels like your house. It feels like your grandparents. It feels like your uncle's home. And there's just nooks and crannies and this warm feeling that's here. It was my grandmother's behind the register, Aunt Gladys hustling customers and socializing and all, and Dad doing the hardware, the skis. He was very, very friendly and cared about his customers. He remembered his customers. What I saw was my dad growing up with two very powerful, progressive, self-supporting women that Dad complimented in his own way. And so it became a really family-oriented store. And, you know, that was kind of what was special about La Hoots. You gotta remember that we grew up above the store. So the store was really a playground for us. We would dress up like as mannequins and jump off cases of beer. It was only until I worked for a Fortune 500 company that I realized that it wasn't really my cup of tea. I was only a year out of law school practicing in DC. In the spring, got a call from Herb right around Easter. And I remember Easter afternoon, he goes, I want to talk to you, let's go for a ride. And we drove from Littleton to Waterville Valley. By the time we arrived back in Littleton, which was like less than an hour later, I made my mind up that I was gonna do it. And I went back to DC and gave my notice and I was back home four weeks later, sleeping in the bed that I slept in all my high school days and I never looked back. I didn't build very much. My boys built this. They gave it the shot in the arm that it needed. They made it what it is today. I think when you look at all the old pictures of my grandfather, they just needed blood in the business, fresh blood. And when Ron and Joe and Herb came home, it was just life instantly infused. It just created this whole new energy that the business needed. My dad, Ron and Herb, ran the shop their own way by their own rules. They wanted to expand and open more doors. The three of them embodied the state motto. Live free or die. I think things were a lot looser back in the 80s and early 90s. It's almost like a blur. Honestly, Herb and I didn't have a clue. It was kind of natural. We would wing it and it would work and business was booming. People were buying freestyle skis and uh, freestyle clothing. It's the year of the hot dog. The hot dog skier, that is.
There were more people skiing. We built a following and we were fair. We just continued to expand and, and we survived. Yeah, I wish that uh, I hadn't had this stroke. I'd be still skiing. Do you feel like at this point you'll ever be able to go on the mountain again? I don't think I'll make it. How many are we doing today? 13. Okay. The stroke hurt his competitiveness more than it hurt his speech because the guy He's a superhero. Is this the last one? Yep, that's it. All right. You missed it completely because that was a way of life for me in the winter. I got promoted at work and was doing kind of the corporate thing. I was a financial analyst. And then I just wasn't happy. I wasn't into it. So I, I stopped the job and I was in my car skiing all over the West. I think my dad battled with it a lot. Coming back home to him, it was just, it wasn't, he wasn't cool with it at all in the, in the onset of it. My dad would have said, what are you doing coming back here? Go out and make something of yourself. Don't come back. He never encouraged any of us to come back. He never said, take the store over, ever. Anthony uh, ha has, I think, a connection with my dad because I think my dad truly, uh, I think he truly loved to ski. And I think Anthony feels that way. Skiing to me is probably the most religious thing that I can do. When I have shit going wrong in my life or I'm stressed about something, it frees me. We have a, a very just innate connection that involves skiing, that involves kind of how we're wired in some ways. There's just moments that you have that are deeper than any moment that I've had probably with another male figure. Okay. All right, ma'am. Trying to carry his spirit onward is what I'm going to do. While the days of skiing in old jeans and leather boots may be over, some legacies will never die. My grandfather was an outcast from an immigrant family, yet he was still able to make a deep connection with the community that will always be remembered. His mentors were strong women from another generation, built on hard work, love, and dedication. He cared about his family, the outdoors, and the people in this community. When I came back home, it was those same people that took me back into the family. And it really made me remember why this part of the country is so special. We miss my grandfather every day. And as a fourth generation Lahoot living in the North Country, my only hope is we can carry on his legacy and put the goddamn skis on and go like hell.
up north where the wind blows free, there's the oldest man, the old man of the mountain, way up north with the bears and the bees. He's way up high, he's made of stone, he was made by God and God alone. All the people come to see his face, he's the oldest man around this place. 